Good morning, afternoon, or good evening, whenever uh, you are looking at this uh, lecture series. Uh, this is a review uh, for Plate Tectonics Laboratory, which you'll be commencing this week. Um, we discussed plate tectonics uh, in lecture over the last week. We provided a comprehensive overview of plate boundaries. We talked about the nature of the magmatism and uh, certainly some of the uh, landforms uh, that were created at these uh, plate boundaries. Today in laboratory, you're going to be looking at a plate tectonic map, and you're going to be applying a lot of what you learned in lecture uh, to uh, sort of real-life uh, examples of how geologists make interpretations about uh, plate motions, uh, may, being able to make predictions of the types of landforms, certain the types of structures, earthquakes, volcanism, all these different things that are important to geology. Now, I just want to provide you a little bit of an overview. Uh, I don't want to repeat what I discussed in lecture, but I want to give you the, some of the more important uh, components that will help you um, complete today's lab. Um, when we actually looked at the plate tectonic system, you remember there were three uh, major plate boundaries. Uh, the first one we discussed was uh, divergence, uh, or where new ocean lithosphere is created, which you can see here in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, you have partial melting of the stenosphere. Uh, that partial melt creates basaltic magma, which because of it being a higher temperature than surrounding rock, it rises, and as it reaches the surface, it diverges outward okay, uh, creating uh, this new ocean lithosphere. What you'll note over time is uh, this new ocean basin is going to get progressively larger and larger. Uh, the two continents that were uh, clearly together uh, get further and further apart over time. Uh, the second component that we were looking at here is the fact that we know the Earth isn't getting larger itself because of the creation of new ocean lithosphere or seafloor spreading that we must be consuming it elsewhere. And that was our subduction margins. Uh, and subduction zones, which is shown here along the, the western coastline of South America. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, first address in detail the divergent margins and seafloor spreading. And uh, this uh, slide here shows you very clearly you've got the partial melting occurring in the stenosphere, and a new ocean lithosphere is created, and it diverges outward. Now, the question is, uh, you know, what's the evidence for this? We, certainly we've been aware since the 19th century about the fact that the possibility of the continents were drifting. You remember Alfred Wegener and the shapes of South America and Africa appeared to match up. But it really wasn't until the 1950s and 1960s when they were mapping the ocean floor, and this was largely being done not because they were so interested in the science, this was because the U.S. military and the Soviet Union wanted to map the ocean floor, and they needed to have uh, clearly understand the topography for submarine routes and so forth. Now, a part of this mapping project also involved looking at the magnetic properties of the ocean floor. And what they found when they were dragging these magnetometers along the ocean floor is that the Earth's magnetism appeared to change, appeared to fluctuate uh, over the uh, length of the ocean floor as you moved away from the spreading ridges. And you can see here, this is a, it could be any spreading ridge. We can say it's a mid-Atlantic spreading ridge. But what they found is over the spreading ridge itself, what they found is that the polarity of the magnetic field was to the north, in which you can see I've drawn the end here showing this is a north polarity. Uh, this is also described as a normal polarity. Okay, North and normal are synonymous terms when we're looking at the polarity uh, as far as the Earth's magnetic field is concerned. But what they found is as they moved off the spreading ridge in either direction, they came to a reverse polarity that the magnetic field actually was uh, pointing towards the south. So I want you to think of south and reversed being synonymous terms when we're talking about magnetic polarity. Now, the way that this was interpreted, and this is a very key component of plate tectonics, is that we now understand that the Earth's uh, ocean lithosphere is being created, and it is being upwelling and diverging outward away from that spreading ridge. Now, what appears to happen is that the Earth's magnetic field is not constant, that it fluctuates over time. And that from a, today we've got a north polarity, but if we go in sometime in the past, we would have a reverse polarity. We go further in the past, we have a normal polarity. The light brown and tan uh, reflects normal or north. The whites reflect reversed. And so it was really the presence of these magnetic stripes that gave us the very important evidence or proof that the ocean crust is being created at these spreading ridges, and it is diverging outward. And with that, the continents are just riding along 
uh, these tectonic plates and not the continents themselves that are actually spreading apart, but it's the creation of new ocean lithosphere between them that is causing them to drift apart. Now, ex exactly why is this uh, magnetic record preserved in the rock? Well, what happens here, what we know is that when the magma is liquid, uh, certain magma types have iron-bearing minerals in them or magnetic minerals that at least would be influenced by a magnetic field. When the magma is liquid or molten, these magnetic minerals have no preferred orientation or alignment. When the magma starts to cool down and crystallize, what happens is these magnetic minerals that are present within uh, the magma, they get preserved in the direction of the prevailing magnetic field. And it turns out that these magnetic minerals have a long axis, and the long axis lines up in the same direction as the magnetic field. And so what happens here, as the new ocean lithosphere is being created and it solidifies, the magnetic field is being preserved in that rock. And so what we see here as we move along and off the mid-ocean ridge, you will note here that what's reflected in the ocean lithosphere is these magnetic reversals that occur throughout geologic time. Now, you might wonder, well, how far back in time do we see these magnetic reversals? Well, we now have a continuous record of ocean lithosphere being created in the Atlantic Ocean that stretches back 200 million years. That's the time when we believe that uh, South America and Africa uh, first began to rift apart, North America and Europe a little bit later. But clearly, we have a record that stretches back that far. And when you actually look at the magnetic fluctuations on the ocean floor, we can see that we just don't have three or four. We have over 30 of these uh, you know, reversals that occur over geologic time. On this, this, is, this diagram here, this is a paleomagnetic time scale, and what it shows you, the colored uh, uh, sections of this time scale represent normal or north uh, polarities. The gray represents reversed, okay? So there's your reversed, and there's your, your normal, R, and there's your N for normal. This is a blow-up of the upper section here. And what you'll note that this stretches back 160 million years. Now, when you're looking at the ocean floor itself, this can give you some very important information. Because if we actually can you know, date the ocean floor, which we now can with the advent of radioactive dating techniques in the 1950s and 60s, we can now directly date the ocean lithosphere. We can actually date the timing of when these polarity reversals occur. You just simply core the ocean uh, uh, crust on either side of the polarity chain, date it, and then you can determine when it occurred. And what you'll note here is the color coordination of this diagram, the red, reflects the same age of ocean lithosphere on all parts of this uh, map here. Because think about it, that these polarity changes or the, uh, occurred simultaneously all over the world. And so a given polarity change is going to be the same no matter what mid-ocean ridge you're looking at here. So if you compare the Pacific and the Atlantic uh, mid-ocean ridges, you'll note that there's a difference in the rate that they're spreading. And uh, I ask you this in lecture, where is the rate of seafloor spreading greatest? And I think clearly you can say that it's specific. And the rate of that spreading, if you actually measure, is about five times the rate of spreading in the Atlantic Ocean. So now what I'd like to do is I want to turn to the actual tectonic map itself and give you a bit of an overview of how this will apply to your laboratory. So now we want to actually look at the tectonic map itself because this is what you're going to be principally working on in your laboratory. There's just a whole range of information on this map. Uh, it's just an incredible amount of information that's helpful to geologists making interpretations. Uh, what I was addressing earlier in our introduction, we were talking about seafloor spreading. And we're talking about the evidence of seafloor spreading and how the polarity reversals are very strong evidence that new ocean lithosphere is being created at the spreading ridges and this, the new ocean lithosphere is symmetrically diverging outward from the spreading ridge. If you look close up here, you'll see that there are a number of black lines that are symmetrically aligned on either side of the spreading ridge. And uh, when I say symmetrically, I probably should uh, have a caveat here that clearly they're not exactly symmetric, that you might see different widths for a corresponding uh, in this case, uh, stripe here, uh, but basically they are diverging outward on either side of the spreading ridge. You'll note here number 2, 3, 3A, 5A. So there's numbers here. What these numbers represent are basically paleomagnetic reversals, and each one of these numbers represents a specific reversal. Now, if you come up to the upper right-hand side of this map here, you'll see that there's a paleomagnetic time scale, similar to the one that I showed you on the PowerPoint slide. Slightly different that it's not color-coded. Here, the black 
uh, stripes represent normal or north polarities. The white stripes represent reversed or south polarities. And you can see, and it's really hard uh, to show on this film here, but if you look close up here, you'll see that the, that is numbered. On this side, you have the numbers that correspond to the stripe numbers that you see uh, along the spreading ridge. And on the other side, you actually have years, okay? In this case, we're looking in millions of years on the right side of this paleomagnetic time scale. The other important thing to note here is that the, this is not an independent time scale, that this was all dated using potassium argon dating, a radioactive dating technique, which we'll discuss in about five weeks uh, later into the quarter. But note that the paleomagnetic reversals themselves do not indicate a given time. They had to be independently dated using a radiometric dating technique. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about subduction zone volcanism and tectonic margins. And then what we'll do is we'll look at uh, those important aspects on the map. And then we should have a pretty good overview uh, to be able to help you uh, do this laboratory. Three. Okay, so now we can get back to our discussion about uh, plate tectonics. And we can focus now on the subduction zones. Uh, and uh, subduction, of course, represents convergence of tectonic plates. And you'll remember from lecture that we talked about three different plate boundaries. Uh, we had ocean-ocean convergence, where ocean lithosphere was being subducted underneath of ocean lithosphere. In that case there, the, it was the denser ocean lithosphere that will be subducted, which is uh, also the oldest ocean lithosphere. This was the Japanese-type subduction zone. There was also a subduction that resulted from ocean lithosphere being subducted underneath lighter continental lithosphere. Uh, that would be like a Cascadian or an Andean type subduction zone. Uh, in both cases with subduction, you're getting partial melting of the ocean lithosphere. Included with that partial melt is uh, sea, marine sediments. Uh, water is being squeezed out of the subduction, which is going to enhance melting by decreasing the melting temperature. But all this leads to a partial melt of ocean lithosphere and marine sediments that creates andesitic magma. That andesitic magma is lighter than the surrounding uh, rock, and so it rises. And it reaches the surface along a conduit and it'll form a subduction zone volcano, like Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, or Mount Fuji, uh, to name a few of these. The third type of convergent boundary, which we're not going to discuss a lot today in laboratory uh, because we're dealing with the Pacific Basin, is continent-continent collision. And remember, we addressed this in lecture where you have, prior to a continent-continent collision, you have to have uh, ocean lithosphere being subducted in a continental lithosphere and a passive continental margin riding along. It arrives at the continent, and being that it has such a low density, it can't be subducted, and you get this collision, and you get this large mountain range that's created in the center of a continent, with very little volcanism. Uh, in this case here, you create granitic magma, which doesn't reach the surface. It often crystallizes beneath the surface. But uh, we're not, we'll address that a little bit later uh, in some of our other laboratories. Now, what we will focus on in today's lab, of course, are the subduction zones, because the Pacific Basin is surrounded by subduction zones. And uh, we mentioned the Japanese subduction zone, and uh, I've outlined the subduction zone here itself. But when you show a subduction zone on a map, it's very difficult on a map view to show the third dimension. So we have to have some kind of symbol to represent the fact that the uh, plate is being subducted. And that symbol that we use are these teeth. And the teeth are placed on the overriding plate size. So you can see here the Pacific plate is being subducted underneath of the Eurasian plate. And the teeth are put on the Eurasian plate. Now, if we look at the map, as we move up to the map over here, you can see here is the Japanese subduction zone. And this is very important in the sense uh, these subduction zones can generate very large earthquakes, as you're aware of. Uh, in the most recent uh, earthquake that uh, struck Japan, uh, clearly it was on this subduction zone. Now, what you'll note here, if you look close up here, you can see the teeth, as I showed you on the PowerPoint slide, the teeth are on the overriding plate side. So you can look at all the subduction zones around the Pacific Basin, and you can de determine which plate is overriding and which plate is being subducted by the presence of these teeth and how the geologists uh, show this on the map. Now, we can also look at our backyard. You are all aware that we have a subduction zone called the Cascadia subduction zone. There I've drawn it in. Now, in this case here, we, of course, we would put the teeth on the east side of the subduction zone or towards North America. Here we've got, of course, the Juan de Fuca plate. And 
over here we have the North American plate. And we put the teeth on the North American plate as it is the plate that's doing the overriding. And so again, we can come up to the map and you can see that is what's shown here. Now you might ask yourself, there's all these, you'll say, oh geez, look at all these uh, teeth in the interior of the continent. And what these teeth represent is old fault systems. Uh, in many cases, when we're looking at Western North America, Western North America itself has evolved over time. And believe it or not, Western North America over the last 200 million years has been having pieces of geologic material being accreted to it. And so really what we're showing here in the case here is which of these segments is overriding and which is, un, is being, oh, is being uh, subducted or at least being consumed here. And so these show you old faults. And so the teeth show you what is the overriding side of the fault there, uh, just for your information. The other important thing I think that stands out here is the, the color codation of the earthquakes. The shallow earthquakes are shown in red and the deeper earthquakes are shown in, in going from green uh, to purple here. Now you should be able to come back to a subduction zone and be able to come up with an interpretation why the earthquakes get deeper as you move away from the subduction zone. And that's something that I would like you to think about before you come to laboratory so that you uh, are actually bringing this information and thinking at a little bit higher level and uh, putting all this material together. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, there is a third type of convergent boundary, collisional tectonics, uh, that uh, we're not going to discuss in detail on these maps. Uh, if you look on the map, and I mentioned up here in North America, uh, Western North America, a lot of what you see in British Columbia here in Washington, Oregon, in the interior, a lot of this was collided, was accreted to Western North America over the past 200 million years. And so, uh, believe it or not, you did have collisional tectonics uh, in your backyard. Now the third major tectonic boundary was the transform faults and we addressed these in lecture. We talked about that the seafloor spreading rates are not the same along all lengths of the spreading margin and because of that you have to have some way to compensate for that difference in spreading rate. And the analogy I gave you is visualized a group of students running, holding hands, six of them, three running at 10 kilometers an hour, three walking at five kilometers an hour. Because your arms are an elastic, they can't stretch, something has to give and you break and you have offset. And you can think of the same thing here uh, with a transform boundary. And you can see that when you come to the tectonic maps, you can see a lot of the spreading ridge, if you look along the East Pacific Rise, you can see these offsets. These are your transform boundaries that basically are compensating for differences in velocity. Sometimes these transform margins can be abducted or brought onto a continental margin, such as the case of the San Andreas Fault in California. And so uh, here we can see uh, the San Andreas Fault is shown here. It is a transform boundary. The plates are not coming towards one another, moving apart. They're sliding past one another. And so uh, we can see a number of transform margins, uh, certainly in the Pacific Basin, but also on the North American plate itself. The last thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to address a little bit later in lecture in more detail, is hotspot volcanism. Uh, today in lab, you're going to look at the Hawaiian Islands, uh, which is a hotspot. The Hawaiian Islands sit over top of a hotspot, at least the modern or the large island of Hawaii. What a hotspot represents is a mantle plume or a heat flux. This very hot mantle material, the sustenospheric melt, rises as a point source and it can melt through the base of the ocean lithosphere. When it reaches the ocean floor, you can actually get basaltic magma erupted onto the ocean floor. If the basaltic magma uh, is a high enough volume, uh, that volcano can actually intersect sea level and form an island like the Hawaiian Islands. What's important about these hot spots is we can think of them as being stationary, at least quasi-stationary. The truth is there may be some slight motion, but we can think of them as being permanent. What that means is that the, as the tectonic plate moves over the hot spot, you're going to get this volcanic uh, event tracking and it's going to more or less track the plate motion. And so when you look at the Hawaiian Islands and the other islands that are trend to the northwest of the Hawaiian Islands, they represent basically the movement of the Pacific plate over that hot spot. So you'll be addressing that, and I will discuss this in a lot more detail in our lecture on igneous rocks. So I think now you're prepared. Uh, please work hard, do your own work, and uh, learn. And I will see you in my next lecture.